So, appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. A um, little bit about me. I started the company about two and a half years ago. It was actually my background uh, as a CMO. I was sitting down with the CEO of a company, and he was looking for a new CMO. And part of the questions that he was asking me were focused around social media. How do we really leverage social media? I said, well, how many employees do you have? He said, well, we have about 1,000 employees. I said, well, how many of them do you think have Facebook? He goes, I don't know. How many of them have Twitter? I don't know. Have you asked? No. And so that really started me in my own kind of exploration of, God, if I was actually supposed to do what I was talking about doing, tapping into these people, what tools would I use? I didn't find any. So I started a company, and we do that. So that's a little bit about me. Let me ask something about you. Raise of hands. How many people here uh, have an IT title or in the IT-related department? OK. How about marketing? OK. And those of you who didn't raise your hand, what? User experience. User experience? So product development? Yeah? Is that what you define as user experience? Who said user experience? <laughs> product development? So what is it? Overall customer experience. Customer experience. Yeah. Got it. Okay, what else? CEO. CEO, great. On the business management side? Perfect. Okay, B2B, raise your hand. All right, B to C. Okay, good mix. And raise your hands. How many people here have a Twitter account? Okay, how many people have a Facebook account? How many people are on LinkedIn? Now, so most people here are on LinkedIn. How many people updated their status update in LinkedIn in the past week? Raise your hand. A lot less. For those of you who haven't, I need a volunteer. Why? Anybody? Just throw it out there. Just forgot to do it. Just forgot to do it. So when was the last time you did it? I, I do it automatically as we introduce them when we have tweets. So you do it as you're doing a tweet or something? Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Interesting. OK. Keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to that. So like it or not, people are talking about your company, right? They are. And if you don't think so, you're missing out, because they are. And what's interesting is your employees are talking about your company. And do you think that they probably have social media accounts, too? Yeah, probably. Do you think that they have the ability to talk about your company on their social media accounts? Absolutely. And what's interesting, this was in the New York Times uh, just uh, a couple days ago, and it really talks about some of the challenges that companies are going after because there's companies out there that are actually trying to fire people because they're talking about the companies. And sometimes they're not saying nice things about the companies. Well, does the company have the right to discipline them around that? Well, people who are in charge are saying no. You don't. It's a free speech thing. So if people are going to be talking about it, if your employees are going to be talking about it, you really need to be engaged in social media as a company. How many people here think that social media is not here to stay? Raise your hand. OK, so it's here, right? We don't need to go through the numbers. But look at the growth numbers. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Just over the past few years, I mean, this is a span of four years, and you look at the growth around some of these different things, everything from a mobile phone to Facebook users to Twitter users, it's really incredible. And the, it's not just about people signing up for the accounts. It's actually about usage. Usage is going up significantly. And that's the thing to remember. So you can either take part in this or be an innocent bystander and not take part and let things happen. <clears throat> I prefer to be proactive. I like to get ahead of it. 
So if you're thinking about getting ahead of the social media juggernaut, kind of put this Caterpillar truck up there. I used to love these things when I was a kid. So you can either get ahead of this thing or it's going to crush you. It's really that simple, okay? It's, it's, it's binary in that respect. So if your company is not actively engaging in social media, somebody else is actively engaging in social media and you have no control over that. And chances are they're talking about you. <clears throat> so, how do you get ahead of this? Really simple. Don't do it alone. A lot of companies fall into the trap. Let me go and hire somebody fresh out of school because they know how to you know, use Facebook. Well, that's a terrible hiring decision, right? Because the person that knows how to use Facebook, guess what they're probably not in tune to? The rest of the marketing mix. So you as a company have a marketing mix. And that marketing mix may not be very broad, or it may be very broad. And so the question is, how is social media now going to come into the marketing mix? And oh, by the way, social media doesn't just hit the marketing mix. It also hits your customer support. It also hits your product design and development ideas. I mean, if you think about where social media lives in the organization, it lives across all the silos because it's a communications mode. And so when you hire somebody that just knows how to use Facebook, you're missing out on the bigger picture. And one of the big pieces of this is what we call your stakeholders. So engage them. Engage your stakeholders. Now, what are some examples of stakeholders in a company? And I'm not talking about stockholders here. I'm talking about the people who have a genuine stake in the success of your organization. It's your employees, it's your partners, your resellers, your customers, your fan base to some degree. So let's talk about these folks. Everyone immediately thinks of fans. Everyone thinks social media. Oh, I need to go out to my fans. I need to get a bunch of likes. Really? Okay. Well, let's use this as an example. First of all, I know you're all dying to know that Justin Bieber just passed Lady Gaga as the top Twitterer. So what's interesting about this is if you look at the numbers here, 33 million plus followers. That's a lot of people. Now, think, this is what I want you to do now. I want you to think about social media as a ticker tape. So, you know how if you, if you watch uh, CNBC, you get the ticker tape down at the bottom? Anybody, know, anybody not know what I'm talking about? So you see the stock trades come by. Oh, IBM just sold for you know, X amount of dollars. Cool, right? So think of social media the same way. She's got 33 million followers. Do you think 33 million followers see every tweet he does? How many people think they see every tweet? No, they don't. So 33 million. So here's an example of a tweet he did. Now he got 28,000 plus retweets. That's pretty darn impressive. But when you break it down, it's a really small amount. Far less than a percent. Uh, favorites. Does everybody know what the distinction between a favorite and a retweet is? Favorite is, oh, I think that's really cool. It's kind of like Twitter's version of a like. Hey, great. And a retweet is, oh, I want to share this with everybody and define this as something that's going to show up in my stream. So favorites, less than a percent. Retweets, less than a percent. And he beat out Lady Gaga. This guy's pretty good. Now imagine you and your organization. Imagine your Twitter feed 
That's for the company. The company Twitter feed. I'm guessing, I'm going to go on a limb here, you're a little less than that. A little less than 33 million followers. So think about it from that point. Maybe you have 1,000, maybe you have 100, maybe you have 10,000, maybe you have 100,000. To get any kind of interaction, the numbers are pretty small. And this is the guy that does it pretty well, right? So that's kind of like the bar, if you think about it. So how do you get beyond that? How do you really get these fans to do something? It's hard. It's really hard. Because Justin Bieber just put it out on the Justin Bieber Twitter feed. Now, keep in mind, there's a fair amount of people that now share it on their feed. So that's how this thing grows. But for you to get to this level, you're probably not. You're probably not. And I would argue, it's probably not going to be your goal. And it shouldn't be your goal. Another example, customers. Why not tap into customers, right? They use your product, they like your product. How many people have heard of Dropbox? Love Dropbox. I use it, awesome stuff. My company uses it, big fan. So what they did is they actually used social media to go viral with, right? So they basically said, hey, you like our stuff? We want to give you more of it for free. All we're asking you to do just throw a little message on Facebook for us. Throw a little message on Twitter for us. And guess what? We'll give you more storage. One time thing, man, did that work for them. People, and, and really, it wasn't, it's not like they're giving away a car. A little bit of extra storage for you. Go ahead and use it. We love it. And by the way, thanks for doing this. And this is a one time thing. They don't keep hitting you up to do it. You get enough people doing that, and all of a sudden, people start seeing this. It starts getting out there. So, and it, it, look, not everyone's going to have a B2C play where this is going to be as effective. But think about this in the context of what you're doing. Think about how you can engage your customers to do a little extra for you. Because what are they doing? It's a referral. Hey, I like Dropbox. I'm using it. Why don't you give it a try? Hey, it's free. It's good stuff. Resellers. How many people are, you, especially IT people here, remember, you know, ArcServe, right? Everybody remember ArcServe? So it's data backup, right? I spent a little time in backup. I know a little bit about this. But here's the interesting thing they're going out to their resellers. And they're saying to their resellers, hey, you know, you would typically get product slicks from us. You'd typically get product brochures. Why don't we give you some prepackaged social media messages too? And now you look like a rock star because we're giving you great content that you can put on your Twitter streams. You can put on your Facebook page, your LinkedIn status update. Great. Now they look smart because they're putting out great industry information, right? They're pushing their product, but it's not overly salesy. It's just, hey, here's some really good information about, you know, how the cloud can complement virtualization. Oh, and look, it's from Information Week. So I'm not just pitching ArcServe. I'm putting out really good industry data out there. And what happens, the reseller now becomes appreciative of this. So, and the reseller's probably selling other products too, but guess what? They kind of like these guys because they're helping them with something they know they need to get better with, which is social media. Employees, IBM. So IBM, taps into their employees to share social media, right? But what they do is they put out great content to make it easy for those employees to update their status update in LinkedIn, to update their Twitter accounts and their Facebook page. And you know what they're doing? They're driving thought leadership. 
big time. Because now you've got some really focused people in marketing who are looking at great content and trying to figure out what's great content that we can put out there that provides us more thought leadership. And let's distribute that. Spray it. Love it. I'm going to give you a case study. So just a <coughs> quick uh, shameless plug for Gagalamp. So what Gagalamp does, it actually makes it easy for companies to tap into these people. So like when you see IBM and CA, they're using Gagalamp to distribute this content to their employees, their partners, their customers, uh, and it makes it really easy to do, right? But I'm trying to stress the point is not necessarily about Gagalamp, but the whole concept of getting people to share your content. So here's an example. So XO Communications, they're a B2B play, right? And a lot of people just, Social media doesn't sound like a natural connection with B2B. It's huge. You need to take advantage of it. So the reason why I asked about the whole LinkedIn thing is because they put 250 uh, salespeople in just as a pilot. In the first week, just by putting out LinkedIn status updates, they drove additional leads and they brought another $10,000 in monthly revenue week one. So think about that. If you just went back and you, and you said, hey, salespeople, update your status. Put in some great company information. You're going to start driving some leads. Not bad. So this is really interesting here, their approach to posting. This is something you should think about. It's not like if you were in a bank, right? Say you're an employee in a bank or a customer of a bank. And all of a sudden the bank turns around and says, oh, okay, guess what? Changed our interest rate again today. Let's go ahead and share that. You're gonna get bored of that. You're not gonna wanna share that. So think about what XO does. XO puts out nine industry-related posts to every one XO-related post. And that one XO-related post is not, you know, buy our stuff 50% off. It's just interesting information about what their product can do. So think about that kind of a mix. Think about really kind of pooling not only your own company information, but also industry information to make what you're providing value add. So they've increased their sharing. Um, by, by sharing, they've increased their blog traffic, increased their lead flow, and what's the ROI look like? Well, the cost per lead by getting people to share social media is far less than any other lead source that they have, paid or unpaid. So increase sharing. Now, sharing really depends on affinity level. So these different groups have different levels of affinity. And what we've seen is that the people who have the highest affinities are the people who have that connection to the company. Sometimes it's a financial connection. I mean, think about it. Employees, they're getting a check. Plus, they tend to be very passionate about the place that they work in. That's a natural level of affinity that's built in. The fans, the prospects, they're not really tied to you. You know, they might be a fan of you one day and the next day they're not. You know, so think about, think about these people that you have on the left-hand side here, your customers, your resellers, your partners, and your employees. These are the people that it makes natural sense for you to say, hey, would you like to share some social media if we made it easy for you? Now, the value of sharing. This is important for you to take back to your companies, right? Because there's going to be people in the company, they're focused on, oh, we need more followers. Not really, right? So once you post your message out on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, the interesting thing about it is what's more impactful? Going out and getting more followers or going out and asking somebody to share your message? 
It's the latter. Getting somebody to share your message, that's what the blue bar is. And we based that, we did this analysis based on click-throughs. So it was a way to, to actually define a call to action. So by getting somebody to share your message, you get far more activity than just having another 100 followers. So it's not about the amount of followers you have. It's about getting other people to share that, that message. That's going to get you much more traction. Whether, whether your goal is more web traffic, lead gen, or even social interactions. Get people to share your message. Now there's a privacy component here. Okay? So think about this. You are you're a reseller. You're an employee. Okay? So they're a stakeholder. They don't want to hand over your, their social media keys to you. Their passwords. Right? They don't want to do that. Has anybody actually been in a company where somebody has asked, hey, can I get your stuff? That's good. There are companies out there that are starting to ask for it. Very strange. But it's yours. It's your Facebook. I, you're not going to hand over your Facebook to somebody else. It's your Twitter. I mean, you will gladly accept content and make a decision on which content you want to share, but you're not going to hand over the keys. So don't go down that path. So when you're tracking this, this is really important because you, you know, a lot of people think about social media in an abstract way. Well, the reality is because there's some great tools that are out there that can help you track it, you can really start defining the ROI. You can actually get closed loop reporting now to find out how much is a tweet worth in terms of sales. It's really awesome stuff. So, but when you're tracking this stuff, think about tracking it in the aggregate. The last thing you want to do is see that Joe Smith did not share this tweet. And then have his boss go to him, hey Joe, notice you didn't share that tweet last week. As soon as you do that, you're going to break that trust with them. And they're not going to want to share anymore. Okay? And there's this tendency with certain organizations to want to do that, to really focus down, well, what did this employee really do? If you go down that route, you will get pushback. Opting in to participating in this is really important. Okay? You're not going to make people do this. You're not going to demand that everybody in the company retweet something. All right? A couple of things. One is you're going to have a mini rebellion on your hands, and the other thing is it's really not authentic. Get people to share the content that they want to share. That will actually drive more results. Because they know their audience better than you know their audience, because you don't know what their audience is. So really, the whole idea here is you're trying to get away from this concept of asking for favors. Would you please share this? I was talking to this company. <clears throat> Once a week, they literally send out an email and they list the 20 tweets that they did that week and say, could you please cut and paste this and send these out? Really? Now I have that to do as part of my job. Great, thanks a lot. So really what you want to do is you want to think about this as creating this content library, this content resource, and you're developing content as a service for them. And again, whether it's your employees, whether it's your resellers, whether it's your partners, think about creating social media content and delivering it as a service. Let's make it real easy for these people to do it, and chances are you're going to get some percentage of them who will take you up on that. And it really does change the mindset. It changes the mindset from a chore to a win-win. Now, why do I say a win-win? Because for those of you who are not active in social media, you're not growing your influence. The second you start adding good content, you start getting more followers. You start getting people paying attention to what you're saying. So by giving them good content that they can share, you're helping them. And in return, they're helping you. So think about that. By creating content as a service, you're creating a win-win. 
for whoever that stakeholder is. So I've got some takeaways, and then we have some time for questions. First of all, don't try to buy your stakeholders. Don't offer the car, right? Because if you start going down the path where you're trying to buy engagement, buy involvement, you're going you're gonna to reap what you sow, which is people who really don't care. So think about it from the point of view of making this fun, making it easy, but you're not trying to buy them. Okay, the other thing, the quality of the message. You know, we talked about, we talked about XO doing you know, nine industry messages to one XO message. We talked about IBM doing a lot of thought leadership. Think about the quality of the message. Again, going back to that bank example. If, all, if you're a bank and all you're doing is you, you want people to tweet the fact that your interest rate has changed again, that's not quality messaging. Stay away from that. And remember, another person sharing a message is far more powerful than going out and getting 100 new followers. Okay? So think about that. So the next time you want to invest a lot of money in trying to get people to follow you, trying to get likes, there's nothing wrong with that, but understand where your value is in terms of getting people to do what is inherently a call to action in every message, which is the link. If you put a link into a message, presumably, what you want to do is you want to take them back to your website for some reason. Take them back to your blog. You want them to read something. And then you can offer them another call to action once they get to the website. So you can provide really quality content, still deliver a call to action, which ties back to your company and potentially selling something at your company by virtue of giving away great content. So, questions? And if you don't have questions for me, I'm going to have questions for you. So. Yeah, so, uh, Jeff. You, presumably, you know, you've worked with a number of companies and uh, have probably experienced this, but when we look at a knowledge company, they do a mm -hmm. lot of re research and reports and writing and stuff, and senior leadership would be, I think, pretty universally terrified of this concept of, you know, trying to engage their employees directly and, uh, and encouraging employees to talk about the company externally. Right. Um, what do you say when you meet that sort of environment? Um, address that? Where does that come yeah, no, I mean, first of all, they, they have to get real, because they're not being real, right? They're, they're, they don't understand that the reality is people are already talking about them. So they can either be part of the conversation and amplify their own conversation, or they can be subject to other people's interpretation of what they think is going on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the reason why they're probably scared is because they probably don't understand the social platforms. They probably don't value the social platforms. So that would be the same company that would either not hire somebody around social media marketing or hire the wrong person, right? So, uh, so my suggestion with a lot of these things is look at the numbers. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, you go in, you start talking to an executive about, about retweets, about likes, about favorites, all this fun stuff. They don't care. They really don't. They run the business by numbers. Show them numbers. How many leads can we get because of this? Oh, by the way, you show them how many leads you're getting, guess who jumps in and starts supporting you? Head of sales. Head of marketing. Oh, we have, we have uniform messaging now that's going out to a lot of people. And by the way, that uniform messaging was created by the people who create messaging, which is the marketing department. So uh, it's, it's a huge win for them. But you have to put it in the context of what they're listening it for. And what they're listening for is typically not the kinds of numbers that most people will just give out initially with social media. Oh, look at how many followers we have. Look at how many retweets we have. They don't care about that. 
So stick to the numbers and it, it speaks for itself. Yes? Um, this is all great from a CMO perspective, right? Yep. Getting the fans, getting the shares going and stuff, but if I look at it from a personal perspective, I'm on the consuming side. So the gentleman's um, exercise or comment about being a knowledge-based company, so I track a few analysts, I follow a few analysts. Yep. They are voracious writers and they write every night. So by the time I get up in the morning, my Facebook is flooded with their shares and the, my LinkedIn's Absolutely. flooded with their yep. status and my email's flooded with their spam and all their, their That's right. articles. So as a consumer- You are in the ticker tape scenario. Consume, how, do I, how do I control as a consumer how I consume, what I consume, and what's relevant? Because when I now put my CMO hat, I have to worry about who my fans and followers are and how many other competitors and other products are bombarding them with the same stuff and how do I stand out from the crowd? All what right, well, so, so I think there's two questions there, right? So the two, more. well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I think what I heard is how do I, as an individual, kind of deal with the overload of information? Right. And on the other hand is, given that everybody's dealing with an overload of information, how do I, as a CMO, make sure I insert my messaging into whatever they're doing? So the, there, there's two aspects to the CMO side. The, one is the quality of the content, because at the end of the day, if you're putting out, you know, excuse my language, if you're putting out shit, right, people don't want it. They just don't want it. But if you're putting out quality content, p believe it or not, people are looking for quality content. That's why you as a user are following all those people, right? Now. For you, as the, as the CMO, if the only place that you're putting your content out is on your Twitter stream, guess what? They're probably, it's probably not gonna get through that deluge of data that you're getting as the user. Which is why if you are having other points of contact, stakeholders within the organization that are sharing it, you have a much better chance of penetrating at the point when you're looking as a user. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, on the user side, there's some things that you can do. First of all, if you're using just Twitter, I would suggest going out and, and getting TweetDeck, which is also by Twitter, which is this great aggregating kind of view. Um, and you can put in certain searches, you can set up columns out of certain things. You still run into this whole idea of the ticker tape, but it helps you really narrow it down. Um, and then keep in mind, if you don't like someone, if you don't like the quality of content that they're delivering, don't follow them anymore. Everyone says, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Well, you're overwhelmed because you, you're following a thousand people and the reality is there's probably a hundred that probably matter to you. So think about filtering yourself before <laughs> you start worrying about the deluge. I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Question, yes. Is that five minutes, or do you have a no, question? We, uh, we have time, and I have a question. Oh, but I want to grab the mic first if you want to grab it, because it's very important. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we're talking a lot about kind of on, on the marketing side and, and how best to take advantage of social media networks and social media um, posting. But from the platform side, I mean, are there efficiencies that are going like, obviously we've been talking about this is all developing. Mm -hmm. where, where are the kind of analysts and the people who are thinking about the social media space, whether it's social media platforms, you know, wikis, other things like that, where are the opportunities for enterprises on the, uh, on the internal side to create efficiencies, to, you know, to, to better serve customers, to, um, to better expand their sales force? I mean, are, what is the thinking kind of in terms of, like in the mobile space, enterprises have you know enterprise app stores that are you know specific and you know and have specific purposes to to create um, efficiencies. Is there the same kind of thinking on the social side of how is social going to impact the way enterprise does business? Absolutely, uh, and in fact, you're seeing tremendous investments by companies like IBM, companies like Oracle, uh, companies like Salesforce, which you know traditionally more of a CRM play. They acquired a couple of major social media players. So Salesforce acquired a company called Radiant 6, which is, a, which is what's considered a listening tool, which can find out whatever anybody's saying amongst a lot of different platforms. 
Um, they also bought more of a kind of a publishing solution, which is um, uh, Buddy Media, right? Uh, you've got these scenarios in which people are acquiring companies, and then you have other companies like IBM, right? I mean, IBM, you know, traditionally has kind of built these large internal collaboration tools, right? Well, guess what? They're integrating social into everything. You know, let's take another example, Yammer. Yammer is kind of like Facebook that's internal. You know, it's got all the kind of features, the sharing, the chat, the IM, within your corporate firewall, right? With, within that corporate domain. Well, guess who just bought them? Microsoft. So I would suggest that the players out there, the traditional enterprise players, are all driving towards that. So no matter who you're currently working with, the IBMs of the world, the Microsofts of the world, the Oracles of the world, they're gonna, ha they're gonna be talking to you about social. If they haven't already done it, they're gonna be talking to you about social, about integrating social within your internal apps as well as your external apps. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah. So the thing is, you know, as, as an individual user, think about this. You are a persona. You as a persona have some social media accounts. When people are looking you up these days, what are they looking at? They're looking at your social media accounts. So think about that. The first impression is not the handshake and the smile at the networking event. The first impression is somebody does research for you. How many people here have heard of a tool called Reportive? Okay, for those of you who don't, check it out. Awesome. Um, so Reportive is this thing. They have this uh, add-in that you can put into Outlook. If you're using any kind of Gmail, it, it's, it does that. And what it does, it pulls the email address of the person and pulls up all of their social information for you. Their LinkedIn account, so you get to see what their title is. And you can go right to their LinkedIn page. So, you know, your first introduction to most people now is not that face-to-face -face thing anymore. Somebody does some research on you. They look you up on LinkedIn. So what does your LinkedIn page look like? When was the last time you looked at what your LinkedIn profile looks like? How many people here checked it in the last month? How many people here updated it in the last month? So think about that. That is really important. I don't care if you're looking for a job or if you're looking to do business with somebody. The first priority for most people now, they're gonna check you out on LinkedIn. You know, if you're going out with a date with somebody, they're probably gonna check you out on Facebook. I know from personal experience, that's the case. So you wanna make sure of that, that you are comfortable with whatever that persona is that they will see as their first introduction. So, any final questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm the CEO of a product company in the enterprise B2B space. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a little context before I ask my question. Sure. So we started off being in a very niche market. And it, it was in the intellectual property space. We grew our market from maybe only 400 customers to 4,000 customers, and then right. well over 40,000. So we entered a very, very broad market space. And as we grew, um, our marketing strategy needed to change. and you know, we used very target database marketing. We knew every one of our prospects. We knew every contact in every one of our prospects. And then we grew to a market where it was impossible to know your prospects. So 
when we were getting to that point, you know, a bulb went off and we said, we can't do the same old marketing, we need to embrace social. And we really kind of got into every form of social and all of that. But when we started actually doing this, thinking that, hey, as soon as we go into social, we're gonna get all the lead generation, et cetera, from social. Um, yeah, you just turn it on and it happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is the dumb CEO thinking that's gonna happen. And of course it didn't happen. And you know, months went by and really nothing happened in social. Mm -hmm. We were everywhere, we were you know, doing all sorts of things and content and really nothing happened. So we needed to kind of retrench and um, kind of do other things to really build out our network. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we, we kind of came back with some of the old strategies married with some of the new social strategies to get to that point. But in this trouble that we're going through, I thought maybe you could comment and maybe throw some of your well, it's, uh, it's, it's insights. Well, it's, it's hard to comment because I don't know what you did. Um, I, I think there, there's, it, broadly, there's the danger with some people that they go in and they dip their little toe into social. So somebody says, oh, I need to have a Twitter page, so they create a Twitter page. Oh, you need to have a Facebook page, so they create a Facebook page. LinkedIn page, they do all that, right? And they don't do anything. And it lies well, dormant. We did a lot of blogs and you know industry content. Yep. And we got all our customers uh, connected with us, and we got all our employees connected within social. And what were your what were your sharing rates? Were you able to track that? I'm sure my head of marketing knows the answer to that. So I, the question that I would ask him: You did all this great content. Where's it being shared? Are the people that have a high affinity for us sharing that content or not? So if they're not sharing, then you're either not making it easy enough, they don't have the affinity you think they have, or the content isn't there. So the idea with content really is for people to take this great content that they believe in and now share it to those 20, 30, or 300 people that they're connected with. Because chances are it's your employee base, it's your customer base, it's your partners. They are connected with the very people that you probably haven't converted yet, but are more likely to be convertible than just somebody off the street. So again, I think what you have to look at is even though you did social, and again, it's, it's hard to kind of give you my perspective not knowing what you did, but you really want to be able to not only do social well, but track it. Because I'm telling you, we see it all the time. So in, in, in our platform, if somebody doesn't share a message, they can provide some anonymous feedback as to why they didn't share it. And you will watch. It, this is absolutely amazing. People, the, the people who manage those gaggles, that's what we call it, a gaggle. People who manage those, they start changing their messaging. And their share rates go up. Why? Because they're listening to the feedback. If you don't have a mechanism to do that, and you think all your content is great, you may be alone in that. And it may be falling on deaf ears. Thank you. You're welcome. So. Thank you very much. Uh, my contact information is here. Um, uh, my email address, which is not up here, by the way, is just uh, my first name, Glenn, with two N's, at gagglelamp.com. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, please do. Please reach out. Love to answer questions. Um, uh, where's Bill? Bill, thanks for the uh, plug of the book. It's on Amazon. It, I, it really, what it does, it, it helps get it for your bosses who don't understand social. It's a great read for them. So thank you very much.